The FCC has cited a Utah ham radio operator for allegedly transmitting on a commercial frequency owned by the Bureau of Land Management. Is this a legit complaint? Is it a mistake or is something nefarious going on? Let's take a look. I've gotten this article from National Communications Magazine, natcommag.com. I highly encourage you guys to sign up and subscribe to Natcom Mag. It is a paid subscription service. I pay, I think it's $5 a month, and I run across some really cool articles. So if you like this type of video, then subscribe to Natcom Mag. I'll put a link in the description below. And this, and they bring up a few interesting key points in this article. This is kind of why I like reading stuff from them. Basic ham radio, Utah operator cited by the FCC. What was the real issue with the technician class ham allegedly transmitting on a federal frequency and says summer, summary of the article is right here. We discussed the FTC's citation of a Utah ham accused of transmitting on federal frequency. In light of a few details, was the agency overly aggressive in going after the licensee? Is there more to the story? We question the handling of this incident. And after reading through the article, I kind of agree with what they're saying. An amateur radio operator in Utah has been cited by the FCC for allegedly transmitting on a VHF frequency reserved for federal government use by the FCC, but was the FCC overly aggressive in its action? So we scroll down here and we look at reading between the lines and reviewing the additional information not included in the citation issued, by, uh, issued yesterday, September 24, 2025. I'm reading this about a, about a week after this was posted. We might be led to believe that the action was not warranted. Read along below as we explain why the FCC possibly could be wrong in its action in this instance. While there are scant details included in the FCC's notice of violation, if you click on this link, it takes you to this page here, notice of violation. And this says, as the article we're about to read, this all says that they accused him of transmitting on this frequency and he admitted to it according to this article and according to what we're about to read. He did admit to transmitting on this wrong frequency. So we're going to read more on that and see what uh, that has to say. The letter was sent to Matthew Davidson, KG7 EFI, a technician class ham who lives in West Bountiful, Utah, a suburb north of Salt Lake City. The FCC alleges it received a complaint of unauthorized operations on 173.675 megahertz on July 10th and that the station transmitting on that frequency was using the call sign of KG says, KG7EFI, the technician class amateur license issued to Davidson. The FCC indicates in its letter that the matter was turned over to its Enforcement Bureau's office in Denver, Colorado. Field agents interviewed Davidson on July 28th, at which time he allegedly, allegedly admitted to transmitting on a frequency on which he did not have a license or authorization to use. Because he reportedly used his amateur radio call sign on the federal frequency, he also admitted transmitting on a non-amateur frequency. Lastly, he admitted to improper oper operation of his station in accordance with FCC rules. That's basically what this notice of violation letter, letter says right here. Licensee for radio communications or transmitted energy. No person shall operate apparatus for transmission of energy and communications or signals by radio. Authorization required and authorization frequency bans. That's what this is talking about right here. Let's take a look at a few of the facts. First, Davidson is alleged to have transmitted on 173.675, which is a frequency used by the Federal Bureau of Land Management, Salt Lakes District, in central and northern Utah from multiple mountain peaks. The frequency is used as a repeater output, meaning that's the frequency you listen on meaning that another frequency, 164.775, is used as the uh, repeater input. So in order, in other words, in order to hit this repeater, he would have had to have this proper offset and CTCSS tone programmed into his radio. It says right here, different CTCSS and DCS codes are used to access the repeaters located in Black Crook, West Mountain, Logan Peak, and Red Spur. And this repeater is used uh, for U.S. Forced Service firefighters to communicate over a vast region because it is located on a mountain peak. Okay, we've seen that before. We saw repeaters located on mountains used post-Hurricane Helene in North Carolina and Tennessee to pass traffic into and out of devastated areas after the hurricane had uh, knocked out all power and communications access in that area. Thus, the FCC is claiming that Davidson was transmitting on a repeater output frequency, not the input frequency, to retransmit his signal over a wide area. It seems ironic that the signal 
would be would have been heard over a wide enough area in the mountainous range that it would have been identified as interference per se. Was the FCC's letter incorrect in that Davidson actually was transmitting on the repeater input frequency? That scenario would make more sense to trigger an FCC investigation. So in other words, what they're saying was if he actually transmitted on the 17366 or 775, 173775 frequency with an HT radio, which it doesn't really say what radio he's using, but if he had done that with and not hit the repeater, but was transmitting on the output frequency, how far would the signal have actually gone? Probably not very far. And he would not have been keying that repeater on top of the mountain if he didn't have the proper input frequency and CTCSS tone programmed into the, into the radio. Now, sometimes they talk about this later in the article. Sometimes we as hams will program stuff like that for monitoring sake. And in your programming software, you can usually check a box that says disallow transmit or turn off transmit to where if you accidentally key up that side of the radio, how many times have you had your radio with dual watch on or dual receive on and you key up thinking you're on the top band, but you're on the bottom band or vice versa. And you start talking, you look down, you're like, Oh crap, I'm on the wrong frequency. Well, that could have been what happened here. Maybe. But again, if he was transmitting on the output frequency, his signal wouldn't have gotten that far. Now, if you want to learn more about transmitting frequencies, where we can and can't transmit, how to use radios, how to properly use radios and get your ham radio license, head over to hamradioprep.com. Use the code of Jason20 to get 20% off of all of their ham radio courses, including a new MCOM course that they came up with last year, a Baofeng Basics course, which will teach you how to pro properly program your Baofeng so that this type of thing doesn't happen, and a new satellite course that they developed just a couple of months ago. Jason20 will get you 20% off of all of the courses at Ham Radio Prep. They are today's sponsor, so thank you, Ham Radio Prep, for sponsoring this channel. The frequencies and tones or codes to access the repeaters are readily available on the internet. Yeah, radioreference.com, you can find a lot of that stuff, especially to aid forest firefighting efforts. The BLM and Forest Service publish those frequencies to allow coordination communications for large-scale fires. In reading the FCC's letter, it appears the alleged violator cooperated with the FCC agents in admitting he was at fault. That is what this letter right here says. Perhaps the FCC decided to formalize the investigation issue a notice of violation to allow him to respond formally. This also allows the alleged violator to respond that he has taken steps to ensure the situation will not occur again in the future. This would be what the FCC would prefer to see instead of a flagrant misuse of the frequency and non-response resulting in a possible fine and or imprisonment. So I've talked in the past about other articles where letters have been sent uh, to a couple of CB guys, and I think maybe a ham radio operator one time, and letters have been sent over and over and over again. They came and knocked on his door. He wouldn't answer the door. Different guys, different, a couple different guys with this situation, and they finally did fine him, and he just flat out never paid the fine. So at least this guy's talking to the FCC. So hats off to him. If he made a mistake, how many of us have never made that mistake? I don't think I've ever made that mistake by transmitting on a commercial frequency. I have mistakenly thrown my call sign out on a GMRS repeater before. It was just a mistake. Now, I have a GMRS license, and I'm authorized to talk on that repeater and that frequency. I just used the wrong call sign. According to what... I'm reading here, there's nothing nefarious going on. This guy was not getting on there blatantly causing interference, trying to disrupt communications or efforts by uh, the BLM or all the, uh, the federal agency at this point in time. So I'm just like, okay, why is this a big deal? We all know there are some hams who program safety frequencies into their radios. Yep. While usually amateur usual amateur equipment won't allow transmission outside of band, import and modified radios could accidentally transmit in non-ham frequencies. Did the person being cited program in this active frequency in his area to monitor and perhaps accidentally transmit on the wrong frequency to make an amateur contact because he had mislabeled the frequency and his radio is a ham channel? There could be any type of situation that occurred, whether right or wrong. Yeah, that's what I was saying. So it should also be noted that the technician license for KG7 EFI originally was issued in 2013, which means it would have expired in 2023. Your amateur radio license is good for 10 years. Ham Radio Prep I mentioned a minute ago, that license you get is good for 10 years. If you buy the Ham Radio Prep course, it's good forever. So when the license pool updates every four, once every four years, your Ham Radio Prep subscription will automatically update. You won't, will not have to pay again. But the license is good for 10 years. However, it appears that Davidson renewed his license just within a two-year window. So his license had expired, and you have, I thought it was 18 months, but maybe it is 24 months, to renew. Now, you can't operate during that time. But you have like a grace period that you can renew your license and not have to take the test again before your license completely expires and you have to start over from scratch. And that's what this guy did. It appears that David renewed his license just within the two-year window, allowed for renewal of an expired license without retesting. 
His new license was issued on June 4th. This incident occurred one month later. Did he purchase a new radio to get back on the air with his new license and program it incorrectly, causing the frequency misuse cited by the FCC? Did he perhaps program an amateur frequency but program an incorrect frequency shift if he wanted to transmit on 147.080, which is a repeater in his area, about 40 miles from his home, and he programmed the shift as a plus 26 megahertz instead of plus 600 kilohertz, he would have wound up on the BLM frequency. Could a harmonic or other garbage from a cheap import radio have caused the problem placed on... I, that's what I thought at first. I thought it might be a harmonic caused by a cheap... Because um, we've done harmonic tests and spurious mission tests on several uh, radios on this channel. But again, an HT, a harmonic would not have been producing more than a watt or two, even if it was a really bad harmonic. And it would not have keyed that repeater if he didn't have the proper input frequency and proper CTCSS tone programmed in. So that seems very unlikely to do that. Lastly, as many import radio users, user purchasers know, many of these cheaper radios come pre-programmed with frequencies that are all across the spectrum. It's not unusual to find frequencies not only for amateur use, but also business, GMRS, public safety, remote pickup broadcast, and more, including federal frequencies. Did this user in his situation pick up an import radio and not realize the radio had been loaded with just amateur frequencies and transmit, and not realizing he was giving out his call sign. The FCC is giving David 20 days to submit a response to the agency's Los Angeles regional office in uh, Cerritos, California. The letter must include an explanation of violations cited, a statement indicating what actions will be taken to correct any reoccurrence, and include a timeline of corrective actions. Once the FCC re re reviews the response... The agency will determine whether any enforcement actions are required to ensure compliance in the United States, Part FCC, FCC Part 97, Governing Amateur Radio. So, this seems like they went to this guy, they said, you did this, he goes, yes, I did. Sorry. Nothing nefarious, nothing, you know, he wasn't being a jerk on the air, he wasn't causing harmful interference on purpose, he wasn't, he at least answered his door and talked to them and spoke to them, and he admitted his wrongdoing and to go on. So, if he transmitted on the output frequency, and again, it doesn't say what radio he's using. Maybe he was using 50-watt radio. Maybe he had a base station radio with an outside antenna, and it was heard for a long way away. Maybe he's halfway up the mountain. I don't know where he's located. I mean, if the FCC comes and says, hey, you made this mistake, and he says, yeah, I did. I'm sorry. My mistake. Won't happen again. Okay. Cool. And maybe spend a little bit more time, guys, going after people who ignore your letters and ignore your citations, and ignore the fines that you impose on these nefarious and harmful interference people. Maybe spend some time going after those people instead of Mr. Davidson here, who obviously made his mistake, owned up to it, admitted to it, and probably just didn't even know he was doing it at the time. So, what do you guys think? I would love to know your comments. Put a comment in this video. Check out the links in the description below for the further information. And check out Natcom Mag, Natcom Magazine. Not a sponsor, not a sponsored at all. Natcom Mag, just a great source for stories like this if you enjoy them. All about FCC restrictions, GMRS, CB, amateur radio, everything else also. And if you really like this video, check out these videos over here, which YouTube thinks you want to watch next. 73.